Have you ever thought about how you hold a isometric contraction? Let's say, for instance, that you're holding a barbell at a 90 degree angle for as long as you can. You might be forgiven for assuming that your muscle fibers are somehow contracting halfway and then just holding that position, exerting a kind of constant force at 50% of your max in order to keep you locked at that angle. You'd be wrong, however. Even something as simple as this is far more complex when it comes to the human body and it involves all sorts of different processes. Understanding these is not only very interesting, but it could also be useful for your training in the gym. And so without further ado, let's take a look at rate coding in muscle and fiber recruitment. As you probably already know, inside each muscle, you have hundreds of thousands of tiny fibers called muscle fibers. These are just thinner than human hairs and they work essentially like telescopic poles. They have an inner and outer filament made of actin and myosin, actin being the outer layer, and this closes over itself in order to shorten and thereby shorten the length of the muscle when they all work together. It's a little bit more complicated than that. It's really a chemical reaction using enzymes, but that's the basic concept of how it works. To trigger this contraction, you need a signal from your brain, a nerve impulse called an action potential. This is a small electrical signal that travels through your nerves from your brain down to the muscle across the neuromuscular junction and then causes the fibers to contract. Now, of course, you're not gonna have a separate signal for every single muscle fiber because that would just be too much. So instead you have a single nerve being responsible for a whole bunch of muscle fibers and that bunch of muscle fibers connected to that one nerve that is called a motor unit. So you have a bunch of different motor units inside each muscle, but these aren't just small little sections of your muscle, they're actually all interweaved. They can spread across the entire muscle and they vary a lot in terms of their size and the type of muscle fiber they contain. So you have smaller ones which exert less force. They tend to contain mostly type one muscle fiber. That means that they're slow twitch oxidative, which means they don't tire out quickly, but aren't capable of as much explosive force. Then you have the much larger motor units, which tend to contain predominantly type 2A and type 2B twitch fiber. And this is useful for powerful contractions, but they tire out very quickly. What makes all this a little bit more complicated than you might assume is the fact that motor units are binary. They can either fire or not fire. They can't be in a state of half fire. Once they receive a certain amount of stimulation that crosses a threshold, an excitatory threshold, then they fire and there's no set gradation. There's no such thing as contracting halfway. There's no such thing as contracting half of the muscle fibers in that motor unit. Therefore, they're on or they're off. And they only last for about 10 to 100 milliseconds, this action potential and this twitch contraction. And that's what makes it confusing. If you can only contract on or off, and if it only lasts for 10 to 100 milliseconds, then how can you possibly hold something at halfway point? Well, part of the answer is something called motor unit recruitment. Essentially, when you need to exert a certain amount of force, your body will recruit a certain number of motor units, only as many as are needed to exert that particular amount of force that you need. And you'll start with the smallest ones, the slow twitch ones, and then build up to the bigger ones as more force is needed. This is called Henneman's size principle. It basically means you always recruit the smallest motor units first. This basically means that if you're lifting up a small spoon, you'll use a tiny percentage of your motor units, mainly containing just small numbers of muscle fibers, slow twitch muscle fibers. But if you're picking up a very heavy weight, you'll use all those plus a whole bunch more, plus the really big fast twitch motor units that contain lots of thick muscle fiber. And this is how you're able to exert a kind of smooth curve of force, how you're able to recruit more and more muscle fibers as they're needed for heavier and heavier weights. At the low end, when you only need a small amount of force, you're only increasing the amount of power by very small amounts because you're recruiting small additional motor units. But as it gets heavier, the step change increases. So you're jumping up larger amounts of force as you lift heavier and heavier weights. That's why you're able to control something light with far more precision than something very heavy. Actually, those very small motor units are firing all the time randomly throughout the day to provide you with muscle tone, the small amount of tension that exists in your muscle at all times. This keeps those muscles at the optimal length, the resting length, which is where you're at your strongest. It removes unnecessary slack so that you can spring into action more quickly. At the same time, it helps you to maintain your posture and it prevents muscular atrophy. Even when you're sleeping, there's a small amount of tension in your muscle. But during those very explosive and heavy movements, we need to recruit those bigger motor units and we need to recruit them at the same time as each other. And this ability to recruit muscle fiber is one of the key factors influencing our maximum strength and it can be trained. That's why it's possible to increase strength with certain types of training without actually also increasing hypertrophy because they work through different pathways. 
So that's how you can exert varying levels of force, but it doesn't explain how you're able to hold a contraction for longer. Those contractions, called twitch contractions, aren't just binary spikes themselves, though there's a small lag, a small build-up before you exert the maximum force, and then there's a kind of cool-off period, a relaxation phase. It's only for a short period of time they're in maximum contraction. So basically accomplish this by sending that signal incredibly quickly, the action potential. It fires so quickly, the discharge rate is so fast, that there's no time for the cool-off period to happen. So it's just a continuous spiking, and essentially that is a continuous force. This is called rate coding, the speed of those impulses, those discharge rates. And this is how the body, the central nervous system, codifies intensity throughout the nervous system. So in the brain, you have your sensory neurons, which receive information about light and sound. And the more intense those stimuli, the more rapid the rate coding, the faster the action potentials. So as you can see, the language of the nervous system is the same whether you're talking about the eye or whether you're talking about the muscles. This is what we call a titanic contraction when you have that continuous force and the speed of those signals is something else that can be trained and the faster it gets the more force you're capable of generating. So when you hold something in place whether it's a pen or whether it's a weight that's exactly what's going on. You'll notice that it's not actually locked in position but rather it's shaking very gently and that's because your body is very rapidly pulsing the muscles in order to hold it in place. It's often been assumed as well that synchronicity in rate coding and in muscle fiber recruitment would potentially result in more force and strength. The idea being that if you could recruit all the muscle fiber in the muscle at once or as much as possible at once, then you'd be able to exert more force rather than recruiting it at slightly different times. However, it turns out that asynchronous firing, asynchronous action potentials are actually just as good and maybe even superior when it comes to exerting force, especially over a long period of time. And this makes sense when you think again about the very short duration of those contractions. Asynchronous firing would help to remove those troughs by cancelling out the waveform essentially. Then there are these safety mechanisms that the body also puts in place to prevent you injuring yourself by recruiting too much muscle fibre at once. The idea being that if you recruited 100% of your large motor units, you'd probably end up tearing your tendons, especially because tendons respond less quickly to training than do the muscles. Therefore, we have these safety mechanisms in place to prevent us from exerting 100% of our maximum force. During an electric shock, all your muscle fibers fire at once, and this can actually propel you across the room, demonstrating just how powerful your muscle actually is when you tap into it all at once. Adrenaline can help us to override this and actually is a huge modulating factor when it comes to our ability to recruit muscle fiber and rate coding. Again, this is all stuff that I'd really like to look at more in future. So now you know all this, what effect does it possibly have on your training? Why did you need to know it? Studies show that isometrics and other forms of resistance training are enough to increase your ability to rapidly fire those signals, thereby getting more strength out of the muscle that you already have. On the other hand, if you use a very large concentric contraction, then you're going to very quickly recruit those larger motor units. If it's over 90 or 95% of your one rep max, then you're going to recruit as many as possible you're never able to recruit 100% of your motor units, however. You're going to recruit as many as possible, though, and that's going to much more quickly exhaust you. But that's what you want to do if you want to train that mind-muscle connection for those bigger motor units and learn to exert more force from the muscle that you already have. Lengthening exercises, eccentric movements, they're going to train you in a slightly different way. You're going to again use those larger motor units at the beginning, but then you're going to intentionally be dropping out motor units in order to exert less and less force. The lengthening of the muscle, of course, has unique effects for your hypertrophy, but it's also going to alter the way you're controlling the muscle. This is also why overcoming isometrics where you're pushing or pulling against an immovable force are so useful. Here you're recruiting as many of your muscle fibers as possible because you're trying to exert the maximum amount of force that you can, and you're holding this for a sustained period of time, thereby strengthening that connection further and allowing yourself to reach fatigue on those muscles. When you train with sub-maximal amounts of weight, maybe you're doing 70% of your one rep max for eight reps, that means you're not going to recruit those larger motor units. Therefore, you're not going to train yourself to be able to exert maximum force. This has other benefits, of course. It leads to metabolic stress. It can help blood flow to your tendons. It builds strength and it builds size, but it doesn't train that connection to the muscle. Unless you go to failure and you go past failure using something like a drop set, in which case you're able to essentially do a pre-workout for your slow twitch muscle fiber. You're exhausting the slow twitch muscle fibers so that they can no longer work and then you have no option but to recruit the faster twitch muscle fiber. But as you can see, you need to consider all these different factors when choosing the right type of training for the adaptations that you're trying to achieve. Then there's the effect that they have on tendon hysteresis, the conversion of muscle fiber types, the different ways in which training will fatigue the nervous system. 
Understanding all this allows you to train smarter and that's always a good thing. The take home then is to think about this and to vary your training as much as possible. Something as simple as varying the speed of your contractions, adding isodynamics into your sets, this can dramatically alter the control you have over your muscle. Likewise, there's much more to research here, such as the effect that electrical myostimulation, EMS, could have on recruitment and rate coding. This means running an electric current through the muscles artificially to stimulate a contraction. As you can imagine, this works entirely different to an authentic endogenous contraction, and it will cause indiscriminate recruitment of muscle fiber and predefined rate coding. Some interesting research suggests that EMS can actually increase the number of acetylcholine receptors at the neuromuscular junction, thereby perhaps enhancing the mind-muscle connection, allowing you to engage more in future. And finally, let's just take a moment to appreciate the amazing complexity of the human body. Something seemingly as simple as reaching for a glass of water actually involves the contraction of thousands of muscle fibers across multiple muscle groups. Your brain handles the necessary muscle recruitment pattern to apply the correct torque and force to multiple joints such that your hand can move accurately through space. It then recruits only the necessary motor units in the hand and arm, firing at a constant rate to allow the necessary tetanic contractions such that you're able to grip the handle. Countless systems are in place to reduce the computational load necessary for such a feat. The myotatic response, for instance, that allows muscle to shorten and maintain its resting length low-level firing of slow-twitch muscle fibre that allows it to maintain tone, and the size principle that automatically recruits only the necessary amount of force. We think that we control our skeletal muscle in a conscious manner, but in fact, we have no idea of what's going on here under the surface. So I hope you found this video useful and interesting. If you did, then please leave a like, please share it around. I really appreciate it. Coming up next is a video on Leonardo da Vinci, what we can learn from him and his life. And then following that, we'll be going back to the Nightwing training for part two of that series. So if that sounds good, then thanks a ton for watching and I'll see you next time. Bye for now.